people's applications, you can get some pretty cool bugs. So that was the why are we doing this? Um, what were the initial aims? What were we trying to achieve with this? Well, really want to have as rapid assessment and targeting of bugs within Python code as possible. Um, you know, you want it to the toolkit to highlight where are the areas that you want to look at uh, and to really pull those out for you. Obviously, we've talked about the information layer rather than the data layer. We want to get source code back. We don't necessarily want to get a, full, uh, a, a disassembly. We want to get source code. We want to see what that guy wrote, how he approached things, where are those bugs going to be. And uh, obviously, the motivation for this was there were some anti-reversing techniques that were in use. We want to get around them, but it would be nice not to have a specific uh, block for each technique, have a more general approach that, uh, that is usable against all the techniques and their, the assumptions that those techniques make. So that's the aims, aims that we're going in with things. Now, obviously, we're going to have to talk a little bit about some of the lower level language. I don't know how familiar people are with Python, so we'll blast through this if it's uh, familiar to people and they already know it. Uh, I apologize. Uh, but without it, some of the people may be completely lost if they haven't seen this before. So there are a few different standard file types with Python. Obviously, the .py, which is what, what's written in the, uh, in the source, sorry, where the source code is, is written. That's human readable. Um, it will run on any Python support platform. Lots of open source products are, are uh, distributed in the .py format. Obviously, you can um, compile this through to a bytecode representation. Uh, the standard bytecode representation is PYC. I'm sure you're all familiar with those. Um, created by compiling or upon import, which is an implicit compile. It's nothing to do with speed of, speed of execution, purely speed up of uh, instantiation. It's the startup time of, if you've already got the PYC there, you don't need to go through the compile step. Um, it is cross-platform bytecode, so you, you can compile it on uh, Windows and use it on Linux or Mac, but it's not cross-version. They reserve the right to between Python 2.4, 2.5, 2.5.2 to uh, change the bytecode up so that one bytecode on uh, bytecode compiled with one version of Python won't be executable by the other version of Python. We're going to have a little look more of that in a second. And they do purposely and document it to, re uh, to allow them to uh, have as much flexibility with changing up the format of the PYC as possible. It's not a particularly complicated format. We'll look at it. Um, but it is undocumented um, so that people don't write a bunch of libraries that depend on this particular format, and then they all break when they change the PYC format. PYO is essentially the same as PYC, um, but it's optimized. Uh, one level of optimization, it will have its asserts removed. Two levels of optimization has the asserts and the inline documentation removed. Um, most of the time, this makes no difference. It just reduces the size of the bytecode. And now and again, if there's code which uses the doc, the doc strings, an example being Python, Lex, and Yak, um, the grammars are encapsulated in the doc strings, uh, then if you compile to PYO, you completely blow apart the, applic uh, the application. It doesn't work anymore. So there is a few gotchas in there. And PYD is the most complex uh, serialized format that Python deals with natively. Um, and it's a, called a frozen format. Um, this compiles uh, the Python into C shared objects and uh, allows it to be distributed without having to have the Python runtime there. Um, there's been a great discussion by this of, uh, with uh, Antifreeze, which is a tool presented at Recon, I think, two years ago now. Um, Aaron Portnoy and Ali, Ali um, uh, did a great tool to be able to easily access the internals of a PYD and uh, change the bytecode within, recompile the PYD, and then use it. They had some funny demos with, um, uh, with some uh, games that were developed in Python. A PYD is a very popular format when Windows is being used uh, for, the, for the target platform. And you'll see a lot of people distributing in PYD, assuming that that kind of uh, contains all their intellectual property. No one can get access to it. So a quick look at the PYC format. It's very simple, as I said. It begins with a four-byte magic number. That magic number is to do the version check. So as we said, different versions of Python uh, work with different, uh, have a different magic number. And they know what, what number they're supposed to work with, so they won't execute another set of bytecode from a different interpreter. Um, there's also the OXO, uh, OD, <coughs> OA bytes in there to purposely break the bytecode if that bytecode file has been uh, accessed in a text editor or something, uh, because it will affect the OXOD. Um, 
Then there's a timestamp. The timestamp's used um, to know whether the uh, PYC needs to be regenerated. If, if there's a PY and a PYC in the same uh, directory, the, uh, and the PY and the timestamp on the PY doesn't match the timestamp embedded in the PYC, then the PYC will be regenerated because the PY could have changed, obviously. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an equality test. It's not a greater than or less than. And then after these eight bytes, there's just the marshaled code objects, uh, which are code objects from Python, which we're going to look at, serialized out. And obviously, there's uh, packaging technologies, py to xe, py to app, uh, CX, freeze, et cetera, which allows people to bundle their code along with the runtime into one big ball, which makes uh, distribution easier. Um, it's used a lot. Um, it allows, uh, the biggest thing it allows is developers to have a modified runtime which they develop, uh, which they release with their code, and uh, we'll look at all the modifications which they put into their runtime to try and avoid people being able to reverse the PYCs back out. So object hierarchy. Um, I'm sure most of you know this, but this is kind of how things stack up in Python land. There's a, a module object. Uh, the module object doesn't have any top-level code object. This is done for performance reasons. It's highly annoying uh, when you're trying to reverse things out. Uh, we'll go into the ways to get around this, but there is no code object at the module object layer. Within a module object, obviously you can have classes. Uh, the superclasses are kept in the attribute underscore bases. Classes have methods. Methods have a function of im underscore func, which holds the function object. The function object has a function code object, which holds a code object, and this is what we want. So it's kind of a big onion, and you have to peel it back. Eventually, um, you get back to, to a, uh, a code object, which is a representation. It's quite a verbose representation of the bytecode, variables, run state. It can affect the framing. Uh, we won't discuss framing today, because that will be another 40 minutes. Um, some of the attributes within which you can see the CO code uh, attribute is actually the string representation of the bytecode, constants names, files names, uh, where it's from, the line number in the source code which this object was from. Now, uh, just to be clear, not everything has a code object. Functions have code objects, generators have code objects, uh, methods have code objects via the fact that they've got a function object within them, but not everything has a code object. Um, so there's some level of uh, reconstruction that we have to do when we can't find a code object for a certain type of object. Oh, wrong way. So that's the stack of, of the objects. Now, uh, obviously, Python has some kind of like bytecode, some, uh, some uh, opcode uh, language, kind of like x86, but very, very much simpler. Um, the opcode got pi represents this at the Python uh, runtime layer. It's just a list of bytecodes, you know, a number, and the uh, mnemonic which, it's, which it maps to. All opcodes are one byte, so there can only be 256 of them. Um, currently, there are 113 defined, um, so there's lots of space for improvement. Optionally, a, an opcode can have arguments, or an argument. Uh, all arguments are a two-byte argument. Um, this, the opcodes which have arguments are just specified by uh, an attribute which is has argument, and it will say the value of the opcode, which is uh, above which all of uh, op all opcodes have arguments. Um, so it's just two bytes, and obviously how those two bytes are dealt with by the argument is down into the AST layer. So if we have some Python source, which is just print bugs, if we uh, disassemble this, this is just disassembled with the dis module from Python itself, you can see uh, the, uh, the bytecode instructions which are there and the two instructions which have arguments. And if we look at the, uh, actually look in the code object, uh, the CO, uh, CO underscore code object, these are the bytes which come out. Um, obviously, that you can see the 6.4 represents load const, 4.7 uh, oh, for print item, etc., etc. So it's a very, very simple representation of a language. So we've blasted through, this is how Python works, this is what it looks like, this is the code object, this is how everything stacks up. Uh, what tools exist currently for reversing Python? Um, general categories, obviously it's disassemblers. dis.py comes with Python as standard, it's just a studlib module. Um, you can pass in code objects or uh, higher level objects and it will give a representation like we saw um, a couple of slides back uh, of the instructions and their arguments. Uh, this implicitly relies on opcodes.py uh, which is 
also obviously a, a standard library module. Um, it looks to opcodes.py for those mappings. So it's looking through the byte stream and it finds each byte and then it refers to opcode.py to be like, what does this represent? What am I going to do with this value? There's some debuggers. Uh, PDB is the standard uh, Python debugger. Uh, it is very extensible. Uh, it itself is extended from BDB, BDP. Um, but it's very much a debugger which is oriented for when you're developing Python code and you've got a bug, where is the problem, rather than you've got a, a closed binary and you want to work out what's in there. Um, so it's, it's a developer aid, not, not really a reversing aid. Um, but it's a good basis upon which to apply other stuff. And a lot of the things, a lot of the functionality which it uh, exposes relies on it having access to a .py file, which from a development point of view is perfectly reasonable for a debugger to assume that it's got access to the source code. Obviously from our point of view, that's not necessarily uh, true. Um, there are some decompilers, um, varying quality of decompilers. Um, they will take an object such as PYC or a PYO and take it back to source. They'll take that file from disk and reverse it out through the understanding of the marshalling format and the code objects. They will go back and give you some, uh, some source code back. There are free ones, there are commercial ones. Some are applications, some are online services. I'm not sure why anybody would use the online service and submit all their source code, but some people do and also pay for the privilege. Um, there are dpython is an online service. Uh, it tends to be very, very good. Uh, decompile uh, is an old one. It's good for Python 2.4, but it hasn't really kept up with some of the newer stuff. Unpyc is a free uh, tool, a free uh, product application, um, which is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's good enough, um, and uh, it, that's the one that I use to extend a lot of stuff into in Pyretic. And there's also bytecode assemblers and modifiers. Uh, Antifreeze would fall into the modifier category, but there are also byte play and bytecode assembler, which are just general Python utilities to work at the layer of building up things from opcode, so from the bottom up rather than writing Python source code and having it compiled down. Um, they do allow the modification of live objects through some various hacks. Uh, if people are interested, I'd certainly byte play is pretty interesting to look at. They've done some cool stuff there. So, if that's all the reverse engineering, uh, tools that are available. Uh, obviously everybody, all the people that are authoring code can see what those tools are. Uh, what are the techniques that they're using to stop people reverse out? Obviously commercial and closed source applications, um, they want to develop in Python because of the speed and the ease and the, and the cost efficiency and the cross-platformness, but they don't want everyone to look at their code. Um, so they've come up with, with an increasingly number of techniques coming out with them uh, trying to stop you being able to peek at the code. Obviously, some of the applications we were looking at had this, and this is where everything began. A high-level observation is all the techniques that we've seen really rely on trying to obfuscate the PYC and PYO when it lives on disk. Um, they're trying to, because all the tools that exist so far are um, focused on taking that static uh, file and reversing it back, all the techniques which have been put in place are tr trying to uh, disrupt how that file is interpreted to disrupt those techniques. And it works fairly well. For all the normal tool sets out there, um, they'll fall over. Um, so we're going to fly through very quickly some of the, some of the uh, <coughs> techniques which are in use. Lots of applications will hide in a packager. So in, in a PYD type file or Py to XE, Py to app, they will just assume that because it's wrapped up, people don't understand how to unwrap it. Um, but there will be standard py uh, PYCs sitting inside. Um, this is often the technique that's seen uh, used on, on Windows 32. If this is it, you just, um, I mean, the packages use standard formats, uh, whether it's zip or whatever, it's very easy to get at the PYCs and then you're home and dry, you can use all the standard toolkits. While I was having a look around for what people were doing, found some source code obfuscation, uh, which is kind of an outlier and we're not going to discuss it very much after this, um, but in, uh, in a similar way to a lot of uh, people, when they're distributing JavaScript malware, they will uh, try and confuse the actual, uh, use a lot of uh, exec statements and try and confuse the understanding of the source code itself. Uh, there is a, a product out there that does, does this for Python. So a, a quick look, you can see the standard code on the left, and once it's gone through this obfuscation, it pops out different on the right. Um, I haven't spent time trying to undo the differences which it makes. I don't think it will be particularly difficult. Um, I think it would, I've never actually seen it in the wild, so I haven't put in any effort to try and reverse it. Um, however, when I was looking on the uh, vendor's website of this product, I came across another product um, called PoreSense, 
uh, allows you to cat-proof your computer. 